Today on With the First Pick, we're talking edge rushers, defensive line, and linebacker rankings. And Rick, that can only mean one thing. Got our guy, Lee J. Doosbel, with us. Dudes is in the house. Dudes is in the house. Oh, yeah. This should be fun. This should be a lot of fun. I know last year, Rye, uh, me and Rick got into a little of a kerfuffle in regards to who could be a under-the-radar guy. And if I'm not mistaken, Rye, I think I said Kobe Turner would be a pretty good player in the NFL. Did I not I say that? I thought you were talking about your West. Hey, what happened with Kobe Turner? <laughs> he had short arms. Dave had that teed up. I was going to say, keen observers remember Lee J as the official president of the Kobe Turner fan club going back some 12 months. And Rick, I believe you have since applied for membership. Any news on your application? <laughs> I, I never said he wasn't going to be a good pass rusher. He can't play the run. So that's what my <laughs> argument was. Everybody wants to throw him in a Hall of Fame after a rookie year. And he had a very productive rookie year rushing the pass. Let's see what he does without Aaron Donald next to him next year. And before, we write this, and before we write the whole story, we only read one chapter in the book. Let's see how the <laughs> chapter two comes up. Hey, Lee J, uh, 20 years from now, when Kobe's getting inducted to the Hall of Fame, Rick's going to be outside the stadium picketing, saying he's not worthy. <laughs> he's not worthy. <laughs> he's 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 a one trick pony. He can only rush the passer. He shouldn't be in the hall. <laughs> I look if forward I'm to that. I'm not mistaken. Rick. I, I tried to tell you guys that Lucas Van Ness would struggle too, Ricky. Here, if I'm not mistaken, he got better though. He got better. It's going to be hard for him to take reps away from Iganagabi, and and that was a six round pick that was actually played really well as their swing guy. He'll be better than uh, Kobe Turner by the time it's all said and done. All right. We'll, uh, we'll, put, a, we'll put a pin <laughs> in that, and we'll revisit that. We're going to look forward now. Um, by the way. Hey, Jay, you looked a little lighter uh, in that last little clip there. Oh, God. You said I did? Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> All right, Rick, let's let's stay on task here. <laughs> we don't need to start hurting Lee J's feelings two minutes into the show. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, exactly. This is what I have to deal with. Imagine being on the road with them last week, Lee J. Man. Uh, by the way, if you guys missed it, Rick and I were at, at LSU Pro Day and UNC Pro Day. You can check that out in the feed. Uh, I'm, of course, Rick, uh, I'm Rick Spielman. I'm Ryan Wilson. That's Rick Spielman. This is episode 141, Rick. And before we get going here, got the L Tope board back up and operational. How many days until the 2024 NFL draft? They do, in case you did not know this, mm-hmm. there are actually 23 days until the 2024 Woo! NFL draft. It's here. It Man, it's here. crazy how quickly this thing is happening here. All right, let's talk some edge rushers, and then we'll get to the defensive linemen and, and the, the linebackers. And for a quick refresher, if you don't know, Lige played more than a decade in the NFL, came out of UCF. Uh, remind me again, uh, Lige. Hey, was- Rick cut me. He was the first show. <laughs> but we're all friends here as long as Rick uh, doesn't say a bad word about Kobe Turner. Let's start with the edge rushers. And Don't worry, every other guest I cut too. I've been in the business 30 some years. There's not one guy that I had come across my desk at some point in their career. That's true. You do say that. Uh, and it is not uncommon for us to be just sitting in the hotel lobby in Mobile, Alabama, for example, and have someone walk up to you that you uh, at some point cut in their career and who was actually incredibly grateful for the things you did for them, not the cutting part, but the stuff prior and after that. So <laughs> you're actually, despite your demeanor on the podcast, Rick, you're actually pretty well liked. Uh, well, I got cut like three times, so I just want to share the wealth. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, welcome to the party. <laughs> and you know what's funny, Lee J? He said yeah. one of the things that stuck with him is that um, when the Lions cut him, they didn't even give him a phone call. Lions, right? I was sitting in an office for two hours. No one, they said I got a slip in the old days in my locker that you were cut. And you go upstairs. I sat there for two hours. No one showed up. No one talked to me. So I just got in uh, my car and started driving back home, pissed as hell. Because at least tell me if I'm not good enough. That's an insane story. Yeah. Like not no, even, every time they don't even have the respect to be like, you know what? We appreciate everything you did, but we're going to go in a different direction. We're just going to slip you a note. And then we're not going to show up after we slip you the note. Yeah, no, I'm like sitting here for two hours. And then I was like, yeah, maybe I'm getting promoted. Am I going to start in week one? I don't know. <laughs> Hey, if you had stayed there, Rick, maybe you would have been the day one started. We will never know. It was know. a test. It was a test, Rick. You well, everything stay. in life's 360, so I never knew 
that at that time I was going to be cutting players, but I always made sure I talked to the players as many guys as at least they had to respect that I would tell them they were getting cut. Mm. Debo, are you gonna are you gonna hit are you gonna play the clip or not, Debo? No. Oh, he's not gonna play it. The Jake Browning clip. Remember when Jake Browning called out Rick for leaving him in the hotel room for four hours? Mm-hmm. <laughs> sure did. That was not All right. I remember getting cut there the last time and just being told like, hey, you know, we might have a spot for you on practice squad. Like, go to the hotel and wait. And so I sat in the hotel for like a couple hours, not wondering, not knowing if I had a job or not. And then just basically got a call from my agent that, you know, they didn't even, they didn't tell me. Like, I had been there for two years and, you know, I've been. He played the extended it, version. Rick, go ahead. Go ahead, Rick. Yes. But he did come into my office and he did say that I did not, I did talk to him. I know. And it was just the, the waiting on uh, the, the practice squad. And sometimes, uh, Dudes, as you know, that I don't know what the practice squad is going to look at till after we see all the cuts from all the other yeah. teams. And we don't get that for an hour later. And sometimes it's three or four hour process before you can get through everything. But I did keep in contact with his agent. And I will not say my version of it because I'm not going to get in the, uh, as they say, a pissing contest with a skunk. Uh, but <laughs> it, 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 uh, he, I always give them credit because Jake was very well liked. I, I like Jake and congratulations on what he was able to do this year and well-deserved. And I'm just giving you a hard time, Rick. You are to a fault. You don't like this part. You are incredibly generous. And I, I think you did things the right way. Uh, Jake Brownie had a different recollection. And, but to your point, you don't know what the practice squad's going to look like in that if sort of situation. I did talk to him. It was yep. just, he was sitting in a hotel waiting to see if he's on practice squad or not. They didn't even which, give you a hotel room. No, I was just, I had my, uh, car just sitting in a parking lot <laughs> yeah it's all no right. hotel to go back to there was no practice squad back in the day <laughs> oh okay it used to be called the taxi squad were you on the taxi squad they didn't have a taxi squad back in the day okay all right let's get to this you know who won't be on the taxi squad or the practice squad or get cut dallas turner <laughs> he's number one on our consensus big board at the edge rush position he's number one he, I mean, sorry, Jared versus my number one edge rusher. But again, it's one in one A. Um, Lee J, I'll come to you first. I'll, let me ask this. How do you compare if you're drafting? I, Rick and I talked about this at the combine. If you have to take an edge rusher, are you taking Dallas Turner or Will Anderson? I'm thinking Dallas Turner. He has more Ooh. upside. Yeah, he has more upside. When you look at the two, the athletic ability really pops on tape for Dallas Turner. And I, I remember watching the interview you guys had with Dallas Turner at the combine and how he was talking about how Will Anderson didn't know how fast and athletic he was because he kind of came in as a chubby freshman. Um, but, you know, first of all, you know, and Rick and Tessa, this guy's from Florida, they're, they're built different, different as far as the athletic skill set. And Dallas Turner, I don't even think has scratched the surface for what he could be at the next level. Uh, I think nobody has a better long arm in regards to pass rushing in this draft. He does a really good job with that long arm. Very physical with uh, tight ends at the line of scrimmage. There'll be times where Rick, you've seen it on film. He doesn't. He isn't even lined up, right? They're still trying to decipher what defense they're in, and he'll absolutely just destroy the tight end in front of him and make a play in the backfield. So when you see that natural ability and give, you know those gifts. You can hone those at the next level. And to me, he has the highest upside at the edge position in this draft. Rick, are you still um, Dallas over Will Anderson? If you had to make that pick, uh, if you look at them both coming out at the same time, uh, I would say, yeah, there was, some, Will to me was longer, but he was not as fluid in the lower body or as athletic. And I'm not saying Will Anderson's not a good athlete because he is, uh, and he's ended up being defensive rookie of the year. Uh, but I think this kid, if you watch them both dropped in coverage, you would say that Dallas Turner almost looks linebacker like with his movements. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you would say the same thing for Will Anderson. Now they both can come off the edge, both rush a passer, both different styles in the way they get to the quarterback, but what doesn't matter, both both work. I just think when you look at Dallas Turner dropping in coverage some this year, that he was smoother from an athletic standpoint than when they tried to do that with Will Anderson. But they're both going to make their money rush the passer. Right. In case you're curious, uh, Dallas was almost 6'3 at the combine, 247. Ran a four four six and then had a 40 and a half inch vertical. Uh, I think if you had any questions about the athleticism or the chubbiness, they were answered with those numbers or, or just watch him play. Uh, Lee, I'll ask you, you have a comp for, for Dallas? 
Yeah, I wonder what Rick thinks about this one. I, I put Chandler Jones as my comp for, oh. for Dallas Turner. Is that too long for you, Rick? No, uh, I just think uh, take off the channel, uh, you know, everything on a football field. Yeah, off the football field. Yeah. I'm just talking about the football player. <laughs> yeah. I, I looked at more of a, a little bit of a Hassan Reddick, Brian Burns type guy, uh, are the two guys that I kind of co- I always combine my uh, <laughs> parables. <laughs> makes it easier. Yeah. Yeah. Makes it a lot easier. Well, who did you really say? Well, it's a combination of those two. <laughs> and don't well, ask th- Ryan. Ryan, you just be the m- moderator in this. Me and Dudes will take over. So don't even give your comp. You know what's funny? My comp was Brian Burns. I was nervous about giving it because I thought you would say he was undersized because he was in the two thirties coming out. But he w- he plays yeah. more than that now. He's a little taller though. I think he's closer to probably. Uh, not a bad comp. Thank you. See, Rick, it's it's it, it doesn't take a lot of energy to be nice to people. That's what I'm hearing. All right, Lujay, I'll ask you this. It's draining, mentally draining. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you this, Lee J. Oh, At number eight is when the Falcons go on the board. Is that the first time we see a defensive player go off the board? I believe so. And if, you know, they're at number eight, they need some edge help. I love the step that Arnold Ebiketti took last year. Yep. Uh, they still need some edge help. You know, Raheem Morris is a defensive-minded coach. They need that solidified edge guy that can kind of build the defense around. I think Dallas Turner – Makes a lot of sense. Plus, you know, a guy that's from Florida but went to Alabama that isn't that far. There'd be a lot of Bama fans probably flocking to the game for the Atlanta Falcons if he were to get drafted there. So I think it makes absolute sense at the number eight spot for them to t- run that card in for Dallas Turner at number eight. Rick, is the lowest he can go number nine, or is there a chance he slips into the middle of the first round? Uh, I had him going. The lowest I had him going was fourteen in New Orleans. Okay, I don't think he would go past there, but. To me, you know, everybody's trying to say this is verse who we're going to talk about next or Dallas Turner off. To me, Dallas Turner is an ideal fit in Raheem Morris's defense. Uh, and that's why I think it's a no brainer for Atlanta to take him at eight. OK, let's talk about Jared Verse, Albany transfer. We thought maybe he'll come out last year to Florida State yeah. returned. And then he and uh, Braden Fist team up just to dominate people week in and week out. And uh, like I mentioned, Lee J. Jared Verse is my edge one but it's close between him and, and dallas and you know the, either neither one is a bad, bad consolation prize but yeah. what i keep coming back to are two of the sacks that jared had during the season uh one against louisville and one against florida where he oh, yeah. picked, picked up the left <laughs> tackle both times threw him at the quarterback and got a sack essentially yeah. and that to me told me all i needed to know uh, about uh the, the power with which he plays but he's also twitchy too i don't think he's as twitchy as dallas yeah. but again what's your thoughts on, on jared verse so it was interesting, right? When you watch the tape, Rick, you don't really see him pop out of his stands getting off the ball. Now, the power, his whole game is based off power. But I think he ran, Ryan, if I'm not mistaken, like four or five something at the combine, which I did not see coming. Um, that lets you know he's got some twitchness a- about him. But his game literally starts with the power. You talked about the speed, the power. The thing that I really love was you talked about it. He could have came out last year, probably would have been the middle of the pack first round pick. But he came back, honed his skills, and really worked on his hand uses because last year his whole game was power. This year you saw some different counter moves. You saw some swipes. You saw some counter clubs to get off of that power and get to the quarterback. So that's what I really love about Jared Verse, right? His decision to come back but then also hone in and work on the details of his games, the fundamental of his game to take it to the next level. So I don't have him that far behind Dallas Turner just because I saw the jump in his rush game. I still think Dallas Turner has a higher upside. To me, you know what you're going to get with uh, Jared Verse. So, Rick, Jared ran a 4.58 at the uh, the combine there. And um, I'll give you my comp. Your comp, I don't remember what it was, but it's better than my comp. But I I likened him to Kentucky's Josh Allen, Jaguars' Josh Allen. I think he's a little tighter than that as an athlete. Okay. I think he's a little more explosive uh, than that. I think – the one thing is I do love this guy's effort and energy he plays with. And two, I think this guy plays with heavy hands at the point. Not only can he rush the passer, but I think he's going to be a really good run defender as well. So uh, I've changed my comps three different times um, <laughs> just because I like to try to mix it up. And I was trying to go through the roll of decks. First guy kind of popped was Ryan Kerrigan a little bit. Yeah. Uh, uh, but – the other guy that we had that he and Jared versus longer, but his explosiveness and power remind me a little bit of Everson Griffin uh, oh, when he was going oh. with us up in Minnesota. 
All right. Can't push back on that. Again, Rick has the unfair advantage of having uh, literal team meetings on all these players. So when he has the comps, I don't have that advantage. And then he throws it in my hear face. My comp? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Rick's probably going to roll his eyes about this one. But when you talk about the explosiveness and power, I saw Khalil Mack in this game. Ooh. That's a little bit, yeah, like Everson-ish, you know, just yeah. that, to uncoil their hips. Uh, yeah. They're, Small they're, school guy. Yeah, yeah, he just uh, he's just a longer version of those of Mac Correct. and uh, of Everson. All right, so we said eight, the Falcons. Is that probably the highest for verse as well? If the team likes him a little bit better than Dallas, he's not going before eight. Lee J, I'll ask you, what's the lowest you think he has a chance to go? Um, I think Denver's at what fourteen. They're at uh, yeah. twelve. Twelve. I think that's the lowest he goes is twelve to Denver. Right around that range for you too, Rick. You mentioned New Orleans for Dallas, so yeah, I had New Orleans because I didn't know if Denver goes with corner or pass rusher, yeah, right, uh, right in that area. Um, we'll talk about corners on Thursday with our guy B Mac, but um, Lee J, I'll ask you this, and Rick, you can follow up. If you're Denver at twelve, are you taking Terry and Arnold or Jared Verse? Ooh, I think I'm taking Jared Verse. I, I've been saying this for the longest, and again, I know I'm a defensive lineman. <laughs> but when you look at it, the league is run by passers and pass rushers right now. You are you have probably the number one corner in football already in Denver right now. Not to say you couldn't add another corner because there needs to be somebody on the opposite side of him. And with Terry on Arnold, he has the flexibility to, to start in the slot as well. But I think Jared Verse just makes too much more sense. You you got to be you got to have somebody that can affect the quarterback right now. They're pretty young at that position. But I think getting Jared Verse would, would transform, you know, the edge position for them right away. Who are you taking, Rick? Hmm. Well, it depends on my board looks like. If I can swing back around and get another pass rusher potentially, because they have Browning and uh, Cooper, I think that are they can get after the quarterback a little bit when they're on the field. We got Benita. Benita's still there too. And Benita, yeah. they crafted it from Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma, the second, yeah. second mm -hmm. round, I believe. So, I I just don't see any depth at corner after. Uh, Sertan. So I would probably go with Arnold just to have two Alabama. Uh, players. <laughs> I was gonna say, you can't ask him that, right? You know, he's going to go with the Alabama guy. <laughs> right. And that's the other thing. And I know this is like the middle of the first round, but Rick and I have been talking about this for months now, Lee J, but this draft class, you know, you hear the evaluators say, I only got 20 first round grades. This draft class, I feel like you can find guys picks 40 through 55 to 60 that can come in right away and, and help your football team where in years past, you're sort of squinting to try to find those dudes. All right, next up. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing, right? We, we, uh, my bad, right? I was gonna say no, that was ahead, that was the ahead. thing. Like when you look at the when you look at the edge group, I think there's a significant drop off after the first three guys, right? Um, and then you know we talk about tiers, tiers one, two, and three. But I think in corner, especially slot corner, there's great value in the second and third round, right? Like so, to me, that's why I would more more so go with the edge guy, right? And then get another guy in the second and third round. And then even a guy like Kyrie Jackson, who's probably going to be there in the third, makes a lot of sense who's going to be there in the third round. So I just think there's more depth at corner than initially thought going into this process. Yeah. Two of my favorites, Javon Bullard and Mikey Sanders still are guys who are going to go on day two. Correct. Um, I heard, I was talking to some people, I heard Sanders still might go higher than a lot of people expect. I love him. I mean, I don't know if I would take him top 32, but that's the. I think he's going to go in the second round for sure. He may go higher. I heard, can you stay on task there, moderator? It's All there. right, let's go. Rick's got his jacket on. He's got a lunch date. <laughs> He's got his, he got his Olive Garden jacket on, uh, Lee J. So we got to get through this thing. He's got a got a hot lunch date. All right, next up, Leatu Latu. Uh, Rick, I'll come to you first. We talked to him at the Combine. Uh, he was a, a great kid. You, you thought he was a little nervous. I thought he handled himself pretty well either way. 6'4", almost 6'5", 259. Ran a four six four. Competed at the Senior Bowl, which first two days of practice, he was dominant. Uh, the last day, he had his leg wrap, but he's obviously fine with that. My comp for him, just for giggles, Rick, someone you know quite well from high school, uh, got Jermaine Johnson vibes from from Lotto. Ooh. He may be a little twitchier than Jermaine. Rick says absolutely not. I think he's, he's more efficient with his hands than Jermaine was coming out. And, and a little smoother in the hips. Yeah. All right. I, you know I love Jermaine, so. <laughs> yeah. All right, Rick, give me your comp, and then you can you – can, uh, Go in any direction you want with Leatu. Yeah, I saw more Josh Allen in him because of the fluidity in his hips. 
Okay. And I saw that to me, he is the best technician out of anyone we saw as far as hand use and his ability to bend and dip through the edges of offensive tackles. Uh, I think he improved as a run blocker. I think, you know, this guy is one of the top three. I don't know how bad the neck has come out. We haven't heard anything from the combine as far as the physicals, if anyone failed him on a physical or not. But I think the guy from a technician standpoint, we said this uh, during the fall, that was a clinic in some of the tapes that I watched. Coastal Carolina week one, you called it a teaching tape. Yeah, I said I would put that and show every young kid how to rush a passer (laughs) and how to use his hands technically the way he played against the w- Coastal Carolina. Nothing so let me ask you this, Lee okay. J. It all depends yeah. on the neck injury, of course, and these Correct. mock drafts that I do. Oh, not because I don't think he's healthy, just because there's such a run on posi- so many other positions. I have a lot to slip it into the 20s. How high Ooh. do you think he can possibly go? Now, again, we got to preface this by saying we assume Minnesota is going to package their picks to move right. up. But if they weren't, I would say the 11 spot makes a lot of sense for the Minnesota Vikings. Um, another spot, just looking at the draft board, that makes a lot of sense. The Rams, they need they need edge guy and defensive tackle. So I would even see 19 makes a lot of sense. I think the lowest he probably slips, I would say 26 to Tampa. Oh, Rick's on board it's, with that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, when you look at him, you talk about the medical ride. If it wasn't for that, He'd probably be my edge too, maybe even one, because Ooh. he's that efficient with his hand usage. Yeah. It's rare that you see a guy that polished coming out of college where I'm not saying you don't have to coach him, but on third down, you're like, just go get him. Just like, like that's what he does. Go get him. I really love the battle between him and Talise uh, Fuaga at the Singer Bowl. Them going back and forth was really good. And the thing about him, his motor, he just never stops with his hand. And, and, and Ricky, you know this, good pass rushers never stop their feet. And they just have an arsenal of moves. And he just comes at you in waves. Like, he never stops. As soon as you think you have him blocked, he hits you with another counter. Like, again, if it wasn't – the medical wasn't a question, he might be my edge number one. The, the thing that I'll say, Ryan, is that out of all these guys, I think it, and it's a veteran pass rush plan, if that makes sense, mm-hmm. is that he knows how to set up an offensive tackle. He's going to yeah. do this. He has a plan on how I'm going to get at him the next time and show him something different. Some guys just know speed to power, and that's what they're going to do and try to beat you every time. This guy actually, with his technique, I think he has a pass rush plan every time he's going against, and I think he used one move to set up another move that he's going to beat him with, if that makes sense. And by the way, uh, if you have any questions about Caleb Williams being the first overall pick, Go watch him navigate that last game of, the, of his career against UCLA. When My goodness. That offensive line <laughs> chose violence against Caleb by not blocking. <laughs> and he was he was doing some things that very few people can do. And Latu was, you know, that that defense is, is pretty good at UCLA, led by uh, Latu. And another guy we're going to talk about here that we talked about in the fall, Rick, is running mate number 15, Gabe, Day, uh, Gabe Murphy. Man, I'm a big Gabe, Gabe, Gabriel Murphy fan. Rick told me he hated him because I liked him. That's what I recall. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know we're going to talk about him later, but when you just look at film, Rick, I was confused as well. I don't think people understand how imposing Loud to Loud to is on film because he made Gabe Murphy look like he was two feet tall. But yeah. Gabe Murphy, if I'm not mistaken, is like 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, yeah. yeah, he's small, way smaller, but he's a going Jesse off the edge now. He's not going to be an every down player, but someone's going to look at him as a DPR because of his energy and effort that he plays with. Yep, 6'2", 247, ran a 468, Gabe Murphy did. And Rick doesn't hate him. I'm just giving you guys a hard time. He can go back and listen to the show. He actually liked him a little bit. All right, next up, Chop Robinson. And uh, the issue with Chop, Lijay, when we watched him in the fall, was how big was he going to be? He was plenty yeah. big when he got to the combine. And then the question becomes, does that tran- the, can he keep that weight on, assuming he gained some weight? He was almost 6'3", 254, ran the 448. Um, 34 and a half inch vertical. I don't think there's anyone with a higher motor in college football with the way he played. He only had four sacks, but at the end of the day, production of sacks isn't the end all be all. Yeah. Um, he's number four on our list. Where are you on, on, on Chop Robinson? And, and do you think he is going to find himself in the first round? To me, he has the biggest boom or bust potential out of all these guys we're talking about in the top five. Um, you talked about his motor. I think he has elite get off, right? I don't think anybody is close in this this draft in regards to getting off the football. 
um, needs some work using his hands, right? And even at, at times that, all, you know, playing against the run uh, needs some more fundamental and technique work. But the twitchiness is something you can't ignore. I think he bends naturally better than a lot of these guys on this list. But again, I think he has the biggest boom of burst because you just you don't see it consistently on film. And then also people talk about Latu's health. I mean, Robinson has had a health issue as well, staying yep. on the field and staying healthy. So that's a big question mark going into this draft as well. I think that's a reason why a lot of people have him as the fourth or fifth end and why he might go to the back of the first round, even though you talked about all the things he can do in, in regards to the twitchiness, the, how hard he plays, right? Uh, stuff that a lot of these other guys can't do. I just think his hands need a lot of work, right? If he can – find the right coach to really mature his hand usage, you might have something really special in Chop Robinson late in the first round. Hey, Rick, um, what's your comp for, for Chop? Because that's a hard one. Yeah. I, I, I got a one after Rick goes. Uh, I actually, uh, because of the way he ran and stuff, I thought he was uh, a little bit uh, Nolan Smith last year out mm. of Georgia. Uh, and then a little bit uh, Byron Young uh, from the Rams. Mm. Oh, okay. That actually is pretty Those good. Those undersized guys that, that, that to me are DPRs, designated pass right. rushers. I think you'd be have a tough time holding up at the point for 17 games and being a full time starter. But I think as a rotational guy that initially start to see how he develops, that he is going to be a really good DPR as rookie year. Mm. Yeah, so let me ask you that, Lee So Nolan Smith went the last pick of the first round, and then uh, Byron was a third round pick. Where is yeah. Chop going to go? I think he's going to go back in the first. I think Buffalo Bills make a lot of sense. Uh, what do you think about this comparison, Rick? Vic Beasley. Uh, oh. I could see that. I think Beasley was longer, a little lean. He was a little bit longer. Yeah, longer I think they're the same type of player. Yeah. And Beasley, Beasley was able to get off the edge coming out of Clemson now. Now, he struggled against the run, too. But right. I think Chop's a little bit thicker through his lower um, and a little bit, uh, yeah, like I said, just thicker overall. But this kid, like I, I agree, he may have the quickest first step out of anyone in this draft off the snap. Yeah. All right, let's move on to Darius Robinson, uh, a guy that – Man, he had a great season. I didn't find out about him till uh before the senior bowl when I was going back to watch those guys. He ran in the four nines. I think I, I do not care. Uh Lee I'll ask you as sort of a tweener as an edge rusher and a and a, and a three technique. Number one, where are you playing him? Number two, um, where does he end up going? Does he find his way into the first round, do you think? Yeah, so this is the thing about him. He said he ran a four nine, but he's also literally like 20, 25 pounds heavier than everybody on this right. list. He's a tweener. He's a guy that can play on the inside and outside. And I think the thing that was interesting, right, was that he wasn't a defensive tackle until this senior season. They moved him to the edge this year. And then people worried, could he actually hold up against a double team at three technique? Well, he did just a fine job at the senior bowl doing that because I think that was a question mark going into it. Can pass rush on the interior now need some some work on his hands on the outside because everything is speed to power on the edge, but he has the ability to kick inside. So I think a team that makes a lot of sense to the Detroit Lions, right, to move him up and down the line of scrimmage, that team makes a lot of sense. They need some edge help as well. Uh, they've struggled at times against the run and the pass. So I think having a guy like him um, who – I know they have a guy similar in Josh Pascal, but he really hasn't just taken that step that they really needed him to. I love Darius Robinson's game. I don't think anybody plays with more upper body violence in this draft than Darius Robinson. There's just go on and turn on that Kansas State take from the, the very first play of the game and see what he does. It's like he goes to work. Like I love this kid's game. It, it's kind of a travesty that he's kind of grouped in with the edge guys because as a D if it was just a D line group, he pr he'd probably be the first or second guy taking off the board. A guy that's a tweener as far as just D line uh play, a guy that can move up and down the line of scrimmage. But I think Detroit makes a lot of sense in, in this draft. Rick, what do you think in terms of how, where are you going to use him? Does Dallas make sense? And do you think he he finds his way into round one? If you have a comp, because that would be that's that's sort of a tougher comp. Yeah, I I don't see him as just a pure edge. That's why I don't know why Debo pulled the uh, you know <laughs> the boss card and put him at edge. I think he's a defensive lineman, and he was the third on my list as a D lineman, not as an edge guy. But all I'm a scout in the corner. Uh, do so I just sit there and put my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> what I say, it doesn't. Okay, right. He he talked to. He did his talking. Okay. Well, I'm gonna... 
I think that the one thing this kid, I, I, I don't care as much because I think he plays faster than that 4.98. I think he's yeah. in the four sevens when you watch him on tape. He's not a 4.5 guy. I think he is a little bit of a straight line speed to power guy off the edge. I think the length's going to really help him inside over guards because I think he'll be able to out athlete some of those guards, especially if they can't move their feet once they get an edge. That really helped him down at the senior bowl. Watching him during the season, I thought he was a second rounder. I think that moving him to closer to the bottom of the first, top of the second, was because of the senior bowl performance. Mm -hmm. I think he's got to get what the right defensive line coach because I don't think he's ever going to be teach him how to one arm and speed the power and then work off the edge as he starts walking the offensive tackle back know what his strengths are because if you think you're going to try to make him be a counter spin guy or some kind of finesse guy I don't think he's going to be effective so understand what his strengths are because I do think he can shock you with his with his length and his natural leverage and then counter off of that but always going forward. But if you're going to have him do finesse swims and counter spins and all that other stuff, it, he's not going to be as effective if you take what he does good and polish that part up. All right. We're going to take a quick break here. But before we do, Rick. Hold on, Ryan. I want to give my comp for him. Oh, yeah. Give me your comp. What do you think about this one, Rick? Desmond Bryant. Is he longer than Desmond? He has, I mean, he has some of the longest arms we've ever seen. Right. <laughs> Robinson. I'm just talking about their play style. Yeah, I, I, I'm 50-50 on that one. Lukewarm, let's just say. <laughs> Lukewarm. <laughs> my Ooh. comp, you know who my comp was? Yeah, here's your comp. Uh, a little bit uh, Keon White from Georgia Tech last year. That, yeah, because Keon was heavier. I think Keon yeah. ran a little better. But, but he was straight I line. think there is yeah. a better football player. Yeah, I like that. All right, Rick, I'm going to ask you this question. Then we're going to take a break, and then we're going to speed things up here because you got to get to Golden Corral, and, and Lee has got a podcast to do in a second. Red Lobster. Thank you. Red Lobster. <laughs> I've got my bib. I brought my bib from last time I ate there. Oh, my God. <laughs> so let's say you're the Detroit Lions at 29, and Chop Robinson and Darius Robinson are on the board. Which Robinson are you taking? Ooh. I'm going with Chop. Oh, okay. You're just going to put him off Aiden and, and get after it. Put him opposite Aiden and get after it. They All need right. another pass rusher, and I think Chop's got more, a little more. He's got more juice as an edge rusher. Yeah, this, fair he enough. Doesn't have juice, but Maybe like I said, I don't James know if there's still. anyone with a, with with a, the first step quickness in this draft like Chop has coming off the edge. Okay. All right. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to hit the defensive line. Lee a sweet spot right after this. It's time for the madness. And CBS Sports HQ has your wall-to-wall -wall NCAA tournament coverage. We got your game highlights, expert analysis, and insights all the way to the Final Four. Start and end your March Madness coverage with CBS Sports HQ. All right, Lee J, we're talking. We're in your neck of the woods now. We're talking defensive line. And I'm going to put our number one and number two guys together, and then I want you to – I want you to tell me the difference because I don't know how big a difference there is between Byron Murphy, the second out of Texas, and Johnny Newton out of Illinois. Because here's the thing, man. You watch Johnny Newton earlier in the season, you're like, okay, this guy has it. And then you get caught up on Byron Murphy, you're like, okay, he's clearly the best. I don't know that there's a huge difference. There isn't, right? We literally, I called you the other day to talk about this very exact conversation. Um, because remember at the Senior Bowl, I was more high on Johnny Newton. Right. Yeah. And then after breaking down Byron Murphy's film, I was like, nah, I've got to put Byron <laughs> at number one. But then I literally, Rick, I literally called Ryan like two days ago, re-watching Johnny Newton. I was like, dude, it's 1A, 1B. Like, it's that close. I mean, when you look at Byron Murphy, the twitchiness kind of reminds me of Ed Oliver. His, his, his ability to wreck things in the backfield, right? And we talked about this too, Ryan. Maybe Rick can, can give an explanation. Why do coaches put their best players – not in positions to make plays. You got Tavondre Sweat, who's 362 pounds, but yet you put Byron Murphy at the zero technique, head up over the center. Make it make sense to me. Get this guy on the edge and let him go to work on offensive guards and centers. Uh, but the crazy thing is, Byron Murphy's that good. He was so efficient playing the zero, whether it's his, using his leverage to, to play the double teams or using that lateral quickness to beat the center off the snap of the ball. So uh, I think when you look at Johnny Newton, we talked about Latu's hand usage. I don't think anybody rushes better 
in regards to having a plan than Johnny Newton at the three technique position. Like he hits you with so many clubs and counter clubs. Um, you go and watch that Kansas game, my goodness, or even that Wisconsin game. They had no answer for him. And you knew that was a guy that that was one of the few guys on Illinois' defense that could wreck the game. And yet guys still couldn't block him. So Right, it's hard. Like, I go back and forth. Like, I called you the other day. I'm still going to give the edge to Byron Murphy. I think he's more gifted naturally as a pass rusher, but I think Johnny Newton just rushes so efficiently, rushes with a with a game plan every time he, he, he gets after the quarterback. Hey, Rick, let me ask you this. I know, you, I know what your answer is going to be, but at any point, if you're sitting up there in the suite wondering why Devondre Sweat's playing three technique and Byron Murphy's playing zero technique, are you <laughs> – are you just asking the question to the coaching staff, or are you just going to keep your mouth shut? No, I'm not going to. I'm going to ask. It's my job. Okay. <laughs> All right. You will. You will say something though. Yeah, I'll just ask what What's the reason? They uh -huh. may have a perfect good explanation. I'm not a coach. I'm right. not throwing up the scheme. So I just want to know from my own knowledge. Gotcha. Not that I'm criticizing a coach or this or that. They have. They're pretty <laughs> smart to, to figure out why they do what they do. So, uh, you know that. Uh, like I said, I'll stay in my lane on far as I'm not coaching and I'm not drawing up schemes. So trying to understand what they're thinking and why they do that. So to me, there is a difference between uh, Newton and Murphy and Murphy to me is different because I've never seen a guy with that lower body when he was on stage. <laughs> I mean, from his, oh hips, my goodness. <laughs> from his thighs through his calves, were as thick and as developed as I've ever seen. And you can see why he's so explosive and quick twitch. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a difference. And I'm not saying Newton isn't quick twitch, but the one thing that when you're trying to separate these guys that really stuck out to me on tape is what I've seen Byron Murphy play versus the run, and he can bend and dip and stand up big oh, offensive okay. linemen. I think Newton gets swallowed up a little bit, especially versus those combo double teams Correct. where this kid stays square to the line of scrimmage. He is under everybody's pads and they're not yeah. moving this kid. And then you add in the pass rush. To me, that was the difference between the two. And Lija, you know, it's funny. And I asked Byron at the combine when we had him on set and Rick was staring at his calves. I said, is there anyone that you struggle with uh, in the big 12? He goes, no, I didn't struggle with anyone. Cooper BB did a pretty good job, but I didn't struggle with anybody. And and he Love was right. Love yeah, he, it, you know, uh, dudes, when they, you know, you have that top. I mean, this kid, it almost like he drops one knee, you know, it's well, like yeah. and then stands everybody straight up and then he comes out of that. Yeah. I just thought that's rare to see that guy's bend and flexibility through his lower body and how developed and thick it is. Yeah. And then exploding out of that, to me, that's the difference between these two. Yeah, and I would agree with that. And I think the play that comes to mind is the Alabama play, right? When he's actually at the zero nose and he gets the combo block from the guard center, he literally, like you said, gets on one knee, has great leverage, is able to flip his hip, split that, and make a tackle for loss. And I was like, yo, this dude's out of this world. And then you talk about the explosive ability to not only do that and hold up against the point of attack, but to rush the passer, like, so, yeah, that's why I say it goes back and forth for me, but Byron is my number one guy. So, Rick, let me ask you this, and, Lee J, I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, at 8-9, yep. Atlanta, Chicago, is there a chance Byron Murphy's the first defensive player off the board? If he's that I special? Don't think, I don't think they take him that high, just because I like the defensive tackles. The young Chicago uh, Bears took last year in the second and third round. Yeah, and Jervon and Brady, Zach Pickens. Correct, and then, you know, Grady Jarrett is still out there, and I think they got um, – uh, I mean, not David Anumata still for the Atlanta yep. Falcons. So I don't think it makes sense for the Atlanta Falcons and the Chicago Bears. They both need edge help. I think when you look at Byron Murphy, the latest or earliest he could go, looking at the list 16 to Seattle makes a lot of sense. Obviously, the Rams at 19 for Byron Murphy after losing Aaron Donald makes a lot of sense as well. Um, and then even you go to Minnesota at 23, which they're probably used to trade up. So, Rick. No chance that Byron's the first defensive guy? No. All right. No. All right. I'm going to group uh, our third, fourth, and, and fifth guys together, and we can talk about them, um, but just so we can get through this thing. Everyone's America's defensive tackle, Braden Fisk. Because I worked my arse off on comparables. Oh, yeah. Give us your comp, Rick. Okay, go ahead. 
So for let's both, do these two. For both players, let's go. Yeah. Okay. For Murph, I had Grady Jackson. Or Grady Garrett. Grady Garrett. Grady Grady Garrett. Garrett. Yeah. And Grady then, Jackson was on Sanford, son. Yeah. <laughs> Shady Grady. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness Randy uh, Jarrett and who'd you have for uh, Johnny uh, I had we, we drafted him Sharif Floyd mm, oh. that's actually a pretty good comparison again that's another cheap comparison but I'll give it to you <laughs> you paid $200,000 for the, the back work on that I, I paid 27 cents to get my comp so you, you, you did good on those that's a little bit more than $200,000 <laughs> Rick with the flex there Lige. all right look here's the thing uh so Braden Fisk is our number three everyone on planet earth loves Braden Fisk Rook Ororo out of Clemson's number four and then Tavondre Sweat who we just talked about Rick let's start here so we don't cheat you out of it I want to know who your comp is for Braden Fisk and then we'll talk about him a little bit okay uh, dudes, just so you know, I don't. I've had this in my room. Don't compare white guys to white guys. That's a rule. Yeah, up. that's a rule. Yeah, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to hold off on my comp, but I am going to tell you who Braden Frisk reminded me of because they almost had the same arm length. Okay, he, he has short it. arms, and we asked, and Rick asked him about that at the combine, and he told us a coach once told me be good at something if you're not physically gifted as everyone else on the field, and his gift is getting to the quarterback and getting off the snap. No, as, as no, good. no, you didn't pay attention like you normally don't pay when they have. What did he say? He said I have to beat the offensive lineman to the punch. So, punch. Yep. and you see it time in and time out on the tape. He's got great get off. And he's into that chest before those linemen can get their hands or their arms locked out on him. Correct. So he can get inside of that offensive lineman's arms, and then he can control them from there. And then I think if you watch the, the Florida game, I mean, he was like uh, – And in the Louisville game. Level. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm going to go uh, – uh, and then he put on a show down at the Senior Bowl. So yeah. I went with Geno Atkins. Damn it, that was my comp. <laughs> <laughs> he got that literally was my cop because they were both short body guys, shorter arms. I think Braden has a little bit higher motor than Gino coming out of college. And Gino had a hell of a career with the Bengals, but that literally was my cop, Gino Atkins. <laughs> so, Rick, was Gino a day three guy because of the, the physical stuff? It was because it was back in the day. Yeah. Everybody yeah. wanted, you know, at five, six years ago, everybody wanted to stop the run because everybody was coming downhill when we had Adrian Peterson's of the world and guys like that. Now it's become a passing lead. These undersized guys have more value because they can rush the passer in line and they can create athletic mismatches versus the guard. I think this kid was better athlete and tested extremely well at the combine, which just rose, you know, that, that just made him more valuable. And I'm not so sure uh, and I'm going to ask you this, Deuce, since mm-hmm. you're a defensive line expert, you're yeah. taking Darius Robinson or Fisk if they're both sitting there at the top of the second? Robinson because of the position flexibility. Um, Let me add- but Ryan, Ryan knows this. I've been high on Braden Fisk since the beginning. I, we were at the senior bowl when we did the first pick, the first episode out there. I was like, Ryan, you might want to watch this guy. <laughs> He's different. <laughs> At that time, I think people had him as a fourth round pick. I'm like, nah, he's going within the second round at the latest. <laughs> hey, let me let me ask you this. So let's say you're a team that in the second round that needs a wide receiver and a def- defensive tackle equally. Are you taking Ladd McConkey or Braden Fisk? I'm taking Ooh. Fisk. I'm taking the defensive lineman because I know there's good receivers. Because I got I got Pearsall right behind McConkey. <laughs> <Yep. right laughs> Yeah. That's you guy. really do. That's you Rick's really guy. do. <laughs> All right. Yeah, a lot more receivers than there is. This is a deep receiver line. class. Yeah, well, look, we have Braden Fisk ahead of Tavondre Sweat, who, as you mentioned, Lige is 360 plus. Are we all in agreement that uh, you're taking Braden over Tavondre? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm Rick? taking probably, there's some guys I know we have at the bottom of our list. Marcus Harris to me, that's 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 the flavor for me. It depends on the flavor you want. At Auburn, I'm McKinley Jackson too. In regards to, to Devondre Sweat, I think they're all in the same tier. I just think it depends on the flavor of your scheme that you're trying to play. Let me ask you, Rick, about Devondre Sweat, who um, 
outweighs just about everyone in the draft. He's a two down player. So you have to understand that. And, and how does that fit into today's NFL when you're trying to stack these draft boards at the defensive tackle position? I think when you're in the front office, when you get guys that size and this kid played hard this year, but what's his uh, history on playing hard down in the down out and what's his weight history? Because is he a guy that's going to come back to camp after he's been through all this and, to stay in at 360 or whatever he is, all of a sudden he shows up to training camp at 380 and can't move. So you may better make sure you do all your background on that. But I do like Sweat a lot. I mean, when you look at those big guys, if he has the football passion and if he's willing to take care and make sure he monitors his weight, uh, you know, then you're getting into because I think he has the potential to be. You know, does is he like the Ted Washingtons of the world, the right. uh, the Patrick Pat Williamses of the world, because he has that size. Uh, and when he does play, he's a pretty unique athlete for his foot quickness. But then Jordan Davis, who blew out the combine and was a giant of a man, really has struggled and really hasn't hit what I think the potential they thought they were getting with him uh, when Philly took him in the first round. And I think Debo moved up to go get him. Even doesn't talk like that. Hey, Lijay, what's your comp for Devondre? <sighs> Big Cody from Alabama. What about you, Rick? Because that's a hard one. Yeah, I, I kind of put it, like I said, the, the, those big nose tackles. But I, uh, uh, but to me, it's kind of like a poor man's uh, Pat Williams to me just because okay. I was around Pat. And the thing is, I just looked it up. Uh, he outweighed Dexter Lawrence by 20 over 20 pounds. And so, you know, Dexter came out and you thought, okay, this guy's enormous. He's at least 20 pounds lighter than Tavondra Sweat and a completely different player, but I'm just trying to find someone in, in that neighborhood. Phil Taylor came out and he was, God, he was only 334. So again, finding 366 is tough and finding a, a three down 366, I, I think feels impossible at this point. Uh, so is there any chance, Rick, that he slips into day three or Tavondra is definitely no. going to be a, Third I think round. he'll be low, low, so go in the third round. Okay. Yeah, I think third round is the sweet spot for him. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's talk quickly about Rook Ororo. I can never get his name right. Ruko. I just put <laughs> it on the list because that's my Ororo. Row, row. Row, row. Row, row, row. There's three rows. Lijay, do you know how to pronounce his name properly? Because I don't want to just. It's Ruko Row, row right? A row, row, row. A, three rows. <laughs> is yeah. it three rows? It's, it's yeah, three it rows. Yeah. A row, row, row. Okay. Rook Ororo. Row. Gotcha, Rook. My bad. All right. Um, Rook, 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 like yeah. Duke. Ro, 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 ro. <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you, Rick. <laughs> oh, God. All right, Lee Jay, uh, quickly, give me your comp for Rook and, and sort of the, the range you see him Whoa. going in. Because I think he's gotten better over the course from 2022 to 2023. Yeah, when you look at his game, right, he has all the tools that you need. And he's one of those guys, uh, Rick, they talk about like that's one of the guys you want walking off the bus first, right? <laughs> <laughs> this, this guy's chiseled up now and, and plays with good strength, has pass rush ability. I think at times, Rick, when you watch him on film, I think he gets in too many personal battles instead of actually just making the play, right? But you love the aggressive nature that he has. Uh, I've been going back and forth with his comp. I'm trying to think of a, a guy that um, that he kind of reminds me of. I mean. I, the way he's, he's chiseled up, it, there's not too many D tackles that look like that coming out. So, um, who's a good comp for him? Rick, you want to go ahead while Lee yeah, J thinks because you did the homework? Think for a second, yeah. Man. I think there's just so much upside. Remember, this kid only played two years of high school football. And I think mm -hmm. we watched him in, you know, in our summer school last year, and he took another jump this year. Right. I think his instincts are getting better. At the position, uh, I think he's more productive. But you can't, like Du said, you can't draw a guy up uh, and like this guy looks. And mm -hmm. I think his athleticism jumps off the tape too. It's just, will the dots all connect when he gets to the NFL level? Will A connect to B to C? Because sometimes he goes from A to C without connecting to B first. Just from whether it's a lack of play time or not playing a lot of football till he got to college. Uh, but the one thing that I always looked at, if it is an instinctual issue, I don't think that's coachable. 
But if he's improving every year, which I think this kid has, then I think he'll continue to have a high ceiling. Some defensive line coach is going to love getting a hold of this kid. And he may be a rotational guy early in his career, but if they can hit this untapped potential, and if it's not an instinctual thing, which I'm guessing it's not, because I do think he makes some plays off of instincts, I think he's got a really good combination of being able to play the run and rush the passer, but he's a ways away from everybody else. But I do think his ceiling is very high. I had a comp of David Anyameta. Mm. Okay. It's actually a pretty good comp. Yeah, and, and looking at my notes and just trying to refresh my memory here, uh, I wrote that uh, consistent was the best word best word to describe his game against the run. I thought he was consistently moving guys off the ball, and, and his pass rush is um, not quite up to that. But to your point, Rick, that's why you have coaching, and that's why when you're new to football, new wish to football, there's there's room for growth. All right. Day two guy? Yes. Yeah. Done and done. All right. I'll miss. Uh, I'll mention quickly some, some uh, defensive tackles that missed a cut, and then we'll take a break and get to these linebackers here. Dwayne Carter out of Duke, um, Marcus Harris out of Auburn. I know me and Lee J have talked about him. McKinley Jackson out of Texas A and M, Michael Hall Jr., who might be one of the twitchiest interior defensive linemen. He's just undersized, at least when he gets high in, in his in his pad level. And Rick, I'll give you Lee J's under the radar guy, and he thought you might not like him until he realized where this young man went to school. Justin Ebioiki. Oh, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, Lee J. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious! <laughs> All right, let's say yeah, quick break. We'll come back. We'll talk with these linebackers real quick right after this. The PGA Tour returns with the RBC Heritage, April twentieth on CBS and streaming on Paramount Plus. All right, linebacker time. Feels like with the running backs. The linebackers have also been devalued in terms of uh, first-round picks. Last year, Jack Campbell obviously went in the first round. Um, but we see these guys go on day two, even day three, even Ivan Pace Jr. undrafted, who end up starting and being impact players depending on when they land. Our linebacker one is Edge Cooper out of Texas A&M. But I'll ask you this, Lee J. If, if Peyton Wilson at NC State was 21 years old and no injury history, would he be your linebacker one? No, Cooper would still be my guy. Oh, okay. I mean, okay, when, you, good. when you look at the film, uh, Rick, just turn on that Alabama film. There's going to be some first round picks on that on that tape. He was the best player on that field that day. I don't even think it was close. I don't think any linebacker in this draft diagnoses and hits it as fast as he does. And you talk about the physical nature and speed. They used him literally, Rick, as a spy that game. People don't realize how fast Jalen Miro was. He didn't look fast that game because of Edric Cooper, man. So to me, I don't care if Peyton Willis was 20 years old. Wilson was 20 years old. Andrew Cooper is my number one guy. Honestly, if a team in the back of the first round wants to take a filler out of him, I wouldn't even be mad because I think he's that good of a player. Do you have a comp? Because these the 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 physical nature of that position has changed in terms of there's yeah. no more Ray Lewis's out there. There's more Roquan Smith's Patrick Queen types. Well, that that was my comp, Roquan Smith. That works. Uh Rick. Would you be shocked at all if we saw Edge make his way into the back half of the first round? Yeah, because linebackers aren't going to go in the back half. They're going to take the pass <laughs> rushers or all uh, these defensive linemen. Or well, Jack Jack went in the I first round. Jack Gamble did. Yeah, I'm not saying that they don't go. I'm just saying it's a rarity. I did, this kid to me, when he hits you, he's one of the few that knock running backs on their back when he comes up and smacks you in the hole. And the one thing that I think he's underrated a little bit is as a blitzer off the edge or through the A-gap. This guy affects the quarterback when they send him on blitzes. So this was my favorite guy, one of my just good football player guys. I know he's athletic and all that, but this guy was hard to turn off the tape because he was so fun to watch. And I agree, I saw the first game I saw was that Alabama game, and it was uh, he put a show on. So uh, my comp was Nick Bolton from – uh, Kansas, Kansas City. That's a juiced up young man too. Who he's a guy who, when you watch him in Missouri, you're like, why is no one talking about him? And maybe it's because of the position he plays. Maybe that position has been devalued. But it wasn't surprised when I think he ended up being a second round pick, if I recall second correctly. Yeah. yeah, and he's lived up to that for sure. Um, 
I'll ask you the same question, Rick, and then you can go right into your Peyton Wilson conversation. Would you take Peyton over Edge if they were same age, same health, all that other stuff? Absolutely not. Okay. So I'm talking about Rick. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think you would agree. Maybe you won't. You don't always agree with me. In fact, rarely do you. Peyton plays a, a, a lot more positionally. You can put him a lot more places on the field. That doesn't necessarily mean he's better at those positions, but I think he gives you that versatility. Uh, I would imagine there's a lot you like about he's a little longer than than Edge. He ran just as well. I think they both ran in the four fives. He does have the injury history with Wilson, two ACLs and two four, shoulders. Four, three. Oh, okay. I, yeah. No disrespect, Peyton. Uh, four, sub four five. Yeah. Uh, what What's your take on Peyton Wilson, who, despite the injury history, still feels like he's going to be top sixty pick? The thing that I was disappointed, and I agree with the range and the sideline to sideline, and he was a tackling machine. Uh, I think he's a little tight when he gets out in space in coverage. I think he can come ahead and, and he can be an effective blitzer. I just, for a guy this size, and a lot of these linebackers don't know how to take on and use their hands. And I think he is a guy that tries to avoid blocks or absorbs contact, doesn't deliver a boat. Now, Edge will come down there and hit you in the mouth. He's not afraid to hit you in the mouth. This guy seems to uh, avoid or just – I wish he was more physical between the tackles. And that's what I have a big issue with him. Yeah. You have a comp? Rick. Oh, go ahead. Who, me? Yeah, you did all the homework on the comps. I don't want to steal you of that. Zach Cunningham. Mm. Okay. Out of Vanderbilt. That's interesting. Same build, too. Yeah, same. I was trying to go same build, ran. Uh, Zach wasn't real physical coming out. I went uh, Devin Lloyd. Oh. Yeah. That's a good That's one. A good one. Yeah. Um, and Rick, I mean, it looks like we're writing the same exact notes because that was my biggest thing with him. Yes, we know he's ultra productive, but at times, like you said, it seems like he ran around blocks and, and used his speed. Now, he's great sideline to sideline. And I think at the next level, he'll be better as a will backer than as a mic backer where he can track guys from behind plays, right? I think the physical nature is what really kind of turned me off when it came to him. Not turned me off. I think he's going to be a good player. But at, at times, you know this, Rick you have to get physical with guys. Like there's not going to be a time where you can just out athletic a guy in space because offensive linemen are becoming more athletic. So there's going to be a time you're going to have to stack shock and shed. And I just didn't see that on tape from him. And uh, age and the injury history, obviously are concerns as well. That said, I, I mean, he's a day two guy. We agree with that. Unless there's something we don't know yeah. about. Yeah. Like, unless he fall, if he's fallen, as he's fallen uh, because of the injury history. Right. Medical. Yeah. And in fact, we saw, Nicobe Dean fall because of undersized and injuries. Correct. Nicobe Dean's a better college player than Peyton Wilson, or is it close? Nicobe Dean can't run like this kid. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Uh, Nicobe Dean was instinctive, but he got swallowed up too because of his he size. Small. Right. Yeah. yeah. But this, I kid, would say, he was also he had some he had more dogs than Peyton Wilson had. On <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. I can't I can't argue with that. <laughs> All right, next up on the list is uh, Jeremiah Trotter Jr., who is still uh, in the image of the the new age linebacker, but he's the closest to a throwback for me yeah. in terms of uh, being physical. Uh, he flashed some some ability in terms of in space against Notre Dame. He had that, uh, I think it was a pick six against Sam Hartman, where he undercut the route. Uh, yeah. Where are you on, on Jeremiah Trotter? Because I, I think he's borderline third, maybe day three for me when it's all said and done. Yeah, I, I was surprised that he was this high on our list. I'm, I'm not the biggest okay. Jeremiah Trotter fan. You, you stated a little bit of an old school guy. I don't think Rick he'll be able to be on the field on third down at the next level. When you see him in coverage at times, real handsy with backs coming out of the backfield, worried about his change of direction. And for somebody that big at times, I didn't see him as physical as I would like him to be for somebody that size. Just knowing the background of his father and how physical his dad was, um, I just thought he'd be a little bit more physical for a bigger linebacker, especially in this group. Okay. Finally, I disagree with you 100%. <laughs> I love that. I love it. Took, it took long enough. It took long enough. What do you I, have, Rick? This guy is an excellent football player. I think he will attack downhill. Now, he's not big, so I understand he gets in golf. But when he attacks, at least he forces the running back to bounce it outside to his pursuit. I think this guy is underrated as an A-glap blitzer. I saw numerous times where running backs couldn't get their hands on him, and he had effect on the quarterback. I think he's underrated in pass coverage. I'm not going to say he's really? going to sit there and do man-to-man -man coverage, 
but his zone, his awareness, uh, his ability to read quarterbacks eyes, I think, uh, is an asset for him. So I really liked him. I think this guy, when I watched him and was Eric Kendricks to me, who was about Jeez. the same size when he came out. That's high praise. That's a, a lot of high praise. And a little bit Ivan Pace Jr. So those are the two. Uh, I think Ivan's more physical than him. This kid, I, yeah, I thought this kid was way more physical than coming downhill and hitting than, than uh, our North Carolina State flash that we talked about. Oh, yeah. I don't even think that's, that, oh, that's disrespectful to the Wilson family, <laughs> but okay. Uh, no, I, 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 I think that's I'm the reason why Cedric Gray isn't on this list, too. Who? Cedric Gray, who we saw last week of Hill. Yeah. I'll say this, though, Lee J. Um, I'm glad that Rick's come around on the undersized linebackers because he he was not a big Ivan Pace guy. Oh, my God. We oh, no, he actually – that, that's the one thing I will give Rick credit for. That was the one undersized guy he really loved. I re- loved him last year. Ryan <laughs> lies about my uh, opinion. That was the one life. undersized Wait, guy right, he actually loved. You did like Ivan Pace? Oh, he loved him. Are you kidding me? That oh, I, po- I apologize. I, yeah. Prisco, uh, Prisco's uh, filled my head with all the the lies that I'd start to that believe. Was, yeah, no, that, was, that was the one because I remember we did the linebacker. And that was the okay. guy he chose for under the radar guy. That was oh around. good. All right, I apologize, Rick. Rick wasn't Ivan Pace Jr. guy. Good. That makes it feel better. Oh my god, but, I got to go back on my record and re 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 correcting it. I know. Got to hire a PR <laughs> firm to set the record straight. All right, this next guy's <laughs> on our list, and I I love this dude, Tyrese Knight out of Utah. And it's another another one of those situations. Uh, Lee, I can't remember. Was he at the Senior Bowl? I get at this point in the process, I can't. Tyrese Knight, yeah, from UTEP, yeah. he was there. Yeah. So I watched him before the Senior Bowl. I was like, all right, who is this guy flying all over the place? And um, it was Tyrese White, right? And uh, I, I think, again, it's hard to tell with these off-ball linebackers where teams have them stacked just because of the positional value. Um, but at 6'0", 233, he's right in the range of what we see. And I, I thought he was a. a, a a thumper for that size. I thought he showed some ability yeah. in space. Um, what'd you think about him, Lee J, when you watch? I him? love, I love, I love this film. I mean, this guy plays with his hair on fire. I think he's really good in zone coverage. Um, my comp for him, and tell me what you think, Rick, is a guy that Kansas City Chiefs just lost in Willie Gay, right? When uh, you talk about yeah. the speed, the speed that he plays with. And to your point, Ryan, he's not the biggest guy, he's like 233, which is actually about where guys are at now, but looks a little slender than that on tape, but he's physical, man. A physical. And again, it's like he has a need to get to the football. And that's what I really loved about his game. I uh, I just did the Arizona game on him. I got to go back and watch more tape on him. But I wasn't. Was game, yeah. yeah. Wasn't like I think he's a Saturday guy at best. How come? Because I, I think he's like a uh, blind dog in a butcher shop. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Black dog in a butcher he, shop. I got to start using that one. Yeah, he's like running. I mean, I love his enthusiasm. He's a hitter. He runs all over the place, but he's like a blind dog in a butcher shop sometimes. Uh, <laughs> he's just going. Sometimes he doesn't know what the plan is. He's just going and chasing whatever scent he has on him. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's bad. <laughs> oh so uh, translation is he, he plays out of control sometimes, even though he's playing with his hair on fire? Uh, he's a place with his hair on fire, but I don't know. Sometimes it looked like he was born on Wednesday and looking both ways for the weekend. <laughs> Rick brought out the joke book for this with Lee All right. So you think he's a Saturday guy guy. I thought he was a, a late day two guy just because of the athleticism and the, the uh, hair on fireness with which he played, but you're, you're not quite as high on him. You would no. take Jeremiah Trotter all day long over him. Yes. And I'm betting a dollar on that one, Debo, that this kid doesn't Ooh. go to Saturday. Uh, oh. That's like that feels like an easy dollar. I'm I'm trying to. I mean, was, you're sitting here like building him up like Dick Buckus minus twenty five. <laughs> call him Dick Buckus. This isn't a strong linebacker group. <laughs> Rick likes he likes making these easy but bets, and then he tries. I to would make love feel to bad. see how Rick feels about our, our our guy from Missouri though, right? Oh my God! If he ever learned, I didn't know he played with arms. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, did you Hunter have you definitely plays with his hands now? You're tripping. No, watch the Georgia game. Rick, are you talking about Tyron Hopper? Yeah. yeah. Oh, you're not a Tyron Hopper fan? Oh, no, not at all. I knew he wouldn't be, though. Oh, okay. All right. Well, he's not number five on our list. He he didn't make the cut because Rick gave him a such a low grade. Uh, so me and Lee, you have to circle back on Tyron Hopper. But let's talk about Junior Colson. Uh, another smallish hair fire type. He's 240. 
Is he? Yeah, he's, no, he's big. <laughs> oh, he is big? Okay. Six, My two, bad. What do you call him? Small. He's 6'2", 238. Um, hasn't run yet. Didn't run at his pro day, so we don't know how fast he is, but he plays fast. He's only 21 years old. Yeah, my apologies. He's, he's 238, so he's on the bigger side of these linebackers. But he's a good athlete. Um, I thought he moved well in space. And um, he feels like another guy that sort of these new-age linebackers have been talking about. And, uh, Rick, I'll start with you. What's your comp for him, and was he – did he sneak into your top five, or did he get there by the uh, aggregate – with the first pick rankings, uh, he got no. He was uh, actually, I had him right above Peyton Wilson, so I like this kid a little bit. Okay, all right. I think he is a jack of all trades, master of none. He's good at everything, but he's not exceptional at one thing. I think he's instinctive versus the run. I think he has sideline to sideline range. I think he can sift through trash and find the ball. I think he's aware in zone coverage. I think he's a good enough blitzer. I think he does everything good. I just don't think he's an exception or something that just says, wow, I, I can't believe I just saw that on tape. But I think this guy is a good, solid, marginal type starter in the league, if that makes sense. So let me give you my comp, uh, Lige, since Rick's always, already spoken. Are you going to give your comp real quick, Rick? And I'll give my. I, I want to hear this one. Uh, this is, I'm just going back and looking at my notes and, uh, I, I like junior Colson. He reminded me in terms of his, uh, the, the spirit in which he played, uh, Aziz Al Shair. Mm. <laughs> uh, I, I disregard your reaction, but Lee J's reaction tells me he doesn't love it either. So <laughs> yeah. Aziz is smaller than him. Yeah. But I'm talking about the, the sideline to sideline, the coming downhill, the throwing his body around like crazy. Nothing, huh? I would I would say more Frankie Louvu. Frankie no. Louvu also plays with his hair on fire. He's another crazy, crazy. I would say more Blake Martinez. Hmm. No, I'm I'm saying Blake hard Martinez going. was a good football player. wasn't overly physical when he came out. Uh, I think Colson's yeah. physical though. I do too. I think I think he's a little yeah, more. You don't physical. think Colson's physical? I think he will step up and take on blocks. I just didn't see the same explosion as when mm -hmm. Edge came up and hit you. Yeah. yeah, fair enough. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you that for sure. So, But I'm not saying he doesn't step up, and at least he uses his hands, not like uh, Hooper, who uh, refuses to use his hands. Hopper. <laughs> Hopper. Hopper. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tyron catching strays. All right, Lijay, tell, yeah. uh, tell me about Colson. What do you think? Yeah, I, I love his instincts. I thought uh, Rick made a really good point. He does everything really well. I don't know if he does anything exceptional. I think he's a really good blitzer as well. And I think he was more physical than Blake Martinez coming out. Now, he played with that cast on his hand, so I think a lot of times that hurt him in regards to the, the shock and said of it. But I never saw him turn anything down. I no. think he's an underrated zone coverage guy as well. And a guy that we're actually high on to pivot this, uh, was his teammate that we know Rick isn't high on him, Michael Barrett. I, I loved his tape as well, too. I think he's a he's a smaller linebacker, but he played with his hair on fire, and they even used him to rush off the edge. But uh, I, I think Colson goes in, you know, third round. It's interesting because I like Braden McGregor a little better than Barrett uh, playing off the edge. Uh, I think McGregor's incredibly raw, number 17. Yeah. And I don't, I mean, he may end up being a day three pick. I, I didn't love Barrett either, but... Um, that's a conversation for another time. Anything else you want to add, Rick? Ugh. <laughs> That's what Rick wanted to add. Yeah, you know he's like shorter linebackers. He, 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 he's in for Ivan I Pace. Do like, I do like Colson as a football player. He is just a good, solid, steady Eddie football player. All right. Fair enough. Oh, by the way, I'm, I misspoke. I'm thinking of Harrell. Harrell is the edge rusher opposite. Brady. Yeah, Harrell, yeah. Barrett's yeah. the linebacker that was next to Colson. That's right. And I had um, I had Michael Barrett graded as a day three guy, so I like Colson a little better than than Barrett as well. So I take that back. All right, that is it. Episode one forty one in the books, Rick. Thanks to Lee J for joining us. Thanks as always to my guy Rick, who, uh, as you may know, got got sunburned. So if you're watching <laughs> on YouTube, enjoy that. <laughs> and thanks to Debo for producing. And thanks to all you guys who watch and listen. We'll be back uh, Wednesday.